Hello and welcome to the GCN Tech Show. Size back, he's uh, he was in Stockholm. He doesn't look to have any frostbite anyway. No, it was cold, but John, we have got a cracking new bit of tech coming up with his very own video very soon mm -hmm. indeed. Back to this video though, we've got a brand new Trek gravel bike. We talk pro bikes at the Spring Classics and we've got some aero sunglasses. Aero sunglasses, it's whatever next. And we induct another product into the Wall of Fame. So, what is hot in tech this week? Well, John, there is that new gravel bike in town. So Trek have just launched the Checkpoint, and we've got to say, haven't we, that looks good. That's a stunning bike. Yeah, so it's available uh, in a carbon framed option or an aluminium framed option. They say the geometry is comfortable, but it's still got that really elegant stance, hasn't it? So it doesn't look too pedestrian like some gravel bikes can. Now, of course, that may not matter to many gravel riders out there, but it means that it could attract a different crowd into that genre, you know, because it looks still like a quite a racy bike, really. Yeah, and how does it actually differentiate then between a cyclocross bike? Well, they well they've dropped the worms. exactly they've dropped the bottom bracket, uh, which in turn makes the stack height, the handlebars, a little bit higher as well. And also check out that that dropped chainstay as well. That's cool. Isn't I it? love that. I just think it looks fantastic. Uh, but it's not just on looks. Obviously, <laughs> there is there is a, a form as well, uh, and that's to allow you to fit a bigger width tire in there. So up to forty five millimeters, they reckon. That's, that's pretty that's big, wide, isn't it? Isn't it? So yeah. if you encounter some bumps on road or off road, depending on where you're going to be riding it, uh, you're going to be riding in comfort and smoothly too. Also, John, part of the reason is because of the larger diameter of the 45 millimeter ride tire. Now, please stop oh, no. me because I'm <laughs> please, becoming mate. slightly oh. obsessed about wheel diameters. These wheels have got to stop. Actually, no, hang on a minute. Let me say one more thing, please. Okay. Uh, so Trek have said this isn't designed around 650B wheels. So if you remember, those are the smaller diameter wheels that you fit larger tires to, to make the diameter the same. What uh, does resonate with the true spirit of gravel grinding though, is that it's got loads of bosses. So you can fit extra water bottles on there to allow you to stray further from civilization. You can fit pannier racks on there, mud guards on there. You can fit bags of any kind, in fact. So you could, should you wish, use this as a full on tourer. Touring bike. Ha, he said it. Yeah, no, this is- You like a touring <coughs> bike. <coughs> no, this is a different type of touring bike, John. Yeah, this, is, right. uh, this is okay. Um, but those are the things actually that they say separates it from the Damani gravel that they already have in the range. Now, it's funny you say that because if you look at the Trek website and you click on the gravel section, you've got the normal Damanes, you've got the gravel Damanes, plus you've got the cyclocross bikes, so the Boon and the Crockett. I mean, I know we shouldn't fixate on a word, but it seems slightly strange that we use the word gravel to basically describe these new breed of all road bikes. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem like a funny word, doesn't it? If only Kaylee Fretz's Grode would catch on, but alas. Well, thankfully it hasn't. No, as I say, it's even worse than gravel. <laughs> anyway, uh, back in January, I spoke to Matt Heyman of Mitchelton Scott about disc brakes, and he let slip to me that back in Europe, waiting for him was the new Scott foil disc bike. Lucky man. However, Lloydie got the first look at it for us, and that was in Abu Dhabi, of all places. Yeah. <laughs> now, you remember uh, this bike was launched back in August. To minimise the penalty of aerodynamics from having disc brakes, they've actually built in sort of aerodynamic tips to the forks, and it can also fit up to 30 millimetre wide tyres, which, I don't know about you, John, I'm thinking Roubaix. It's been a long time since we've had a wet Roubaix, but if we did have a wet Roubaix, I think there'd be quite an advantage to have disc brakes in a race like that. One thing that could help with Rupay actually is easier wheel changes. So Scott say that they've designed little recesses into the dropouts that should make that process easier. And then when you add into the fact that Munchton Scott are running in the new Jura race, of course, yeah. and therefore they're allowed to use that rearward direct mount derailleur position that Shimano say give easy wheel changes as well. That might help. Yeah, we're starting to see quite a few bikes with that on now, aren't we? Yeah, well, it yeah. kind of makes sense. If Shimano are doing it, you kind of got to follow, haven't you? Yeah, neat solution. Now, speaking of Shimano, they've actually just launched a couple of new pairs of their S-Fire glasses. Ooh. And our man Lloydy, he's managed to get his hands, or ears, or nose, <laughs> on a couple of pairs. We found a new product for you here at the Abu Dhabi Tour. These are the new shades from Shimano. We have the S-Fire X and the S-Fire R. Uh, the ones I'm wearing, as you can see, have a rim right the way around. Uh, they come in a variety of different colours and also different lens options. And these ones 
as you can see, are the rimless. Uh, now they say that the rimless ones are for the roadies and these ones are for mountain bikers, but most of the riders that I've seen here are using both here at the Abu Dhabi Tour. Now I'm really not up to date on the weight of sunglasses and what's particularly light or not. But apparently the rimless version weighs just 25.6 grams and the rimmed 28.6. That so sounds quite light, doesn't it? It's a pretty lightweight. And apparently as well, they're designed to reduce turbulence. See? Aero glasses. I didn't know that was a thing. No, well you do wear those Bono things, don't you? <laughs> Never sacrifice style for speech, John. That's uh, rule number one. What did you sacrifice style for then, mate? More tech. Later in the show. If you're a fan of racing, then last weekend will have undoubtedly have had you glued to your TV screen or your computer, because it was, of course, the opening weekend to the cobbled classic season. Omnopet Newsblad, followed by Kerner Brussels Kerner. Yeah, and for those of you who love bike tech, that's, this time of year is as exciting as the races itself. Yeah. Because pro riders and their bikes, they take an absolute hammering from those, quite frankly, Horrible Belgium roads, <laughs> cobblestones, technical descents, crosswinds, cow sh loads of cow. Sh yeah, and if ever you get the chance to go over to Flanders and check out those roads, you'll be amazed at how on earth they get a peloton, 150 riders or more, around all those tight, narrow roads without chaos and trouble. Yeah, well, more chaos anyway. Yeah. And it is actually true. So what then about the bike tech that's going to help the riders navigate those roads? The first point to note, we think is that as far as we could tell, there were no pro riders in the men's races using bikes with disc brakes. Lots on team cars, none on the road. The women's peloton was slightly different though, both Bolst Dolmans and Canyon SRAM teams at least were using disc brakes. Now, why do we think then that the pros aren't necessarily embracing the change to disc brakes? Well, firstly for me, the first one is wheel changes. Yeah. Because for you and I, it doesn't really matter. We're not racing if it takes 10 seconds or 20 seconds to change a wheel. Nope. But for a pro, that could cost them the race, possibly. Yeah, absolutely spot on. I think that's what always strikes me is odd that there's this fixation around using Paru Bay as a launch pad for disc brake bikes. Mm. I think I've said this before, but it's the one race of the year where you were almost guaranteed to get a puncture and so therefore you would be burdened with slow wheel changes. Zero chance pretty much of getting a spare bike from your team car. But on the flip side, you don't get any advantages of disc brakes because it's pan flat, so you kind of don't really need to brake all that much. It's weird. Yeah. Now another point is that basically maybe there's a not so much of a push anymore from sponsors to actually try and get those riders to use them because we, the consumer, Ultimately, we kind of know that what might work for Greg Van Avermaet or Peter Sagan doesn't necessarily work for those of us who are just doing general road riding. That's it. You're not going to see those guys on a gravel bike anytime soon. There'll be no question about what brakes you'll be using. That's right. <laughs> so what are we seeing then? Well, I think it struck us both, hasn't it? The proliferation of aerodynamic bikes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably got a lot to do with the fact that the latest generation make really great all-rounders. Started... I think by when Canyon launched their latest version of the Aero in 2014, you ended up with aero bikes that were stiff and light and had great tire clearance, but yet all the aerodynamic benefits as well. Like I say, they make great all round bikes now. It doesn't take much for pros to follow the pack. No. Uh, and with Alexander Kristoff, he won the Tour of Flanders on a Canyon Aero. And Matt Heyman, he, of course, he won Paris Roubaix on a Scott Foil. Of course, an aero bike as well. So that's food for thought. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Uh, now, the other thing we're seeing, or another thing rather, is uh, more integrated bars and stems, isn't it? So that's a very easy way of a rider getting a more aerodynamic bike because they have a really significant effect on the aerodynamics. Obviously, it's all about that frontal area. And uh, so, yeah, much more of those in the bunch. Yeah. And what's striking as being a retro geek, or a geek, or just retro, I don't know, <laughs> let me know, uh, is that these days, bikes don't really have to change much for, you know, Tour of Flanders, especially. No, no they don't, do they? Um, 10 years ago, we used to see mechanics bringing out from God knows where, these old box section aluminium wheels, 36 spokes, tied and soldered with those infamous green and black Vittoria tires. They don't need to do that anymore. No, that's right, standard carbon wheels are plenty strong enough yeah. for those roads, aren't they? Uh, one thing that I'm interested in, in particular, actually, is whether or not teams have really looked into running wider tyres for the Belgian classics, as well as Paris-Roubaix. So at the moment, you get big fat tyres at Roubaix, but normally teams are running like 25s for Flanders. 
But given how rough those Flanders roads are, I do wonder whether or not there's an advantage to be had from running bigger tyres there. I don't know, mate. I mean, the roads out there, they are rough, but they're not Roubaix rough. No. Uh, and I don't think that those sectors of cobblestones are necessarily bad enough to warrant going up to 28s. But the race is often split on the cobbled sectors, on the climbs. Yeah. So if you've got a smoother ride, you're able to deliver the power better. You can maybe even get out of saddle because your tyres are so grippy and squishy. I just wonder if that made a difference. And of course, don't forget that, that modern carbon wheels are getting ever wider, which means that although there's a slight penalty for running wider tyres, it's much less than it used to be because that transition from tyre to rim is much smoother, therefore causing much less turbulence. So the, I don't know, maybe we'll see it yeah. this year. There are maybe some games we'll to be had. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't know. We'll keep our eyes peeled anyway on that one. Some science is needed, John. Mm. Gearing that largely remains untouched, other than in Repari Rebay, where the inner chain ring generally it goes bigger. So if you were to dislodge your chain, it's not such a big jump to fall down onto. So normally you've got like a 46 tooth chain ring there. Yeah. So those 1128 cassettes pretty much solve everything, don't they? Yeah. Right. Very, very interested to hear what you will think about this subject. Firstly, how excited are you for the Spring Classics? Oh, so, oh yeah. Oh yeah, and then let us know it. in the comments as well what you think. Is it a case that modern bikes are just so capable the riders don't need anything special? Or is it the fact that modern bike construction means that there's actually very little you could do to customise bikes? You know, carbon bikes come out of a, a mould and it's very expensive to create different moulds. Some brands can afford to do so, so Trek have got special geometries, but otherwise not very much. So uh, yeah, make sure you let us know. And also, of course, have we missed anything? Yeah. Is there something glaringly obvious that has been specialised for the classics already? Get involved in the comments. And last week, Emma and I, we spoke about smaller wheel diameters for smaller riders. And I did that much to, uh, I think, probably your disgust. I can't believe that you talked about wheel diameters in my absence, John. I was a little bit, little bit upset about that. But anyway, we've been getting stuck in the comments. I did watch it with interest, actually. I did enjoy it. Uh, but yeah, some of our favourite comments. Bcom, 700C, 650B or 650C. We really should refer to them by their bead seat diameter. Yes, 622, 584 or 571 millimetres, please. Ditch the old system. No. I, yeah, I, actually, no, actually, I do no, disagree with that. No, Bcom. Yeah, so cycling is a sport with a rich heritage, and actually sometimes it's quite nice to have these slightly weird yeah. antiquated things, Keep isn't the there? traditions there. Retro geek. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to leave it with you. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's, it's, right. it's not that broken It's not yet. broken. No. Terence Bennett, uh, basically, he agrees. His son rides a 650C wheel because he can't get a proper fit on a smaller bike with 700C wheels. And I can totally go along with this. Um, whenever you see, you know, a child on a bike with oversized wheels, or what looks like oversized wheels, they just can't handle the bike, can they? So, yeah, there we are. Uh, Mario Arias as well, shorter rider here, always using a size small. He says 650B, it means no toe over up. I don't think that I can go back to 700C. Yeah. Uh, Papa Geno says, when they worked in a bike shop, there was loads of different wheel sizes. 650, 700, 27, 26 by one and a quarter, 26 by one and three eighths, 24, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Still to this day, he doesn't understand why bikes don't get made basically for smaller people because it's a nightmare for them working in a shop and they can't say, well basically they just have to say, sorry, but they don't make a bike in your size. Yeah. And yeah. they also say, imagine Emma on a 29er. Nah, that's true actually. Um, funny story, John. Uh, I was out riding my bike with a mate of mine on Sunday. We bumped into Emma, and uh, we we then we had a chat. We rode together for a bit, and then she split off to go a separate. Was way. she at that ice cream van? We, I wasn't at the ice cream van. No. Uh, and anyway, my mate afterwards was like, "Oh, you know, Emma's. You know, she's really like she's really small on a, on a bike, isn't she?" Uh, but he hadn't noticed that she was riding different wheel sizes. He just thought that there was this like miraculously small bike, and it, you know, but it's just she just looks perfectly proportioned on it. Yeah. Just obviously a little bit smaller. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. When you see her on a bike with smaller wheels, it just looks spot on, doesn't it? Just yeah. So there we go. Anyway, another hot topic next week. But in the meantime, get stuck in in the comments. Right then, John. I think it's time for some more tech, mate. Yeah. Now, sorry. If I was to tell you that the weekend watching Omloop Head Newsblad, I was so excited. What would you say? I'd say. Sounds about right, mate. I can imagine you getting rather giddy in front of Omelette Pet Newsblad. Well, yeah. But the reason I was so excited is because I spotted Bernie Eisel on what I thought was a new Cervelo frame. Really? Yeah. Check yeah. it out. So what is it? 
Uh, actually, so it's just a normal, normal Cervelo R3 in a fluoro yellow colorway. Yeah. That's, yeah, I thought that's there was something of, special out there, but there wasn't. That's like a Cervelo storage on on a par with one of Lloydies. I mean, that's like a that's quite a non-story. Yeah. Uh, although, quite. if we're thinking about <laughs> flash color schemes, have you seen Greg Van Avermaet's BMC? That yeah. is a stunner. Ah, oh, I love that bike. Absolute beauty of a bike. And do you know what? If you're Olympic champ like Greg Van Avermaet. In my opinion, you can have as much gold on your bike as what B.A. Baracus used to wear around his neck. In fact, I would have had a gold chain, I would have had gold bar tape, just gone completely gold, probably. <laughs> okay. Just saying so, gold, gold finger style. Well, you see, I'm not, I'm not really a gold kind of guy. I mean, just as well, really, that I didn't win the Olympics, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have known what to do with it. Uh, so I'm quite glad that Greg has gone for a less is more approach, because mm. don't forget as well, it's kind of it's coming up to two years since he won the Olympics. It's true. By yeah. the time it gets to Spring Classics 2020, we'll be like, oh come on, yeah, Greg, give it true, a rest. Yeah. We know you won the Olympics. And moving swiftly <laughs> on, have you ever thought about just how much weight you can save from your cables? I have actually, Sai. Funnily enough, I'm glad. Oh, well, there we go. Funnily enough, I actually got some fiberglass cables. These ones here from Alligator. Fiberglass. Yep. Yeah. So instead of using traditionally, we use sort of strands of steel wire, don't we, with a with a plastic liner. This fiberglass. Wow. And I actually cut two meters of sh standard Shimano derailleur cable and weighed it up against this one, and it was 52% lighter. So this was 30 grams, 62 grams. Wow, and how much do they cost, those ones? Uh, $30, actually. So if you really are that bothered about saving some weight, it's a good option, I reckon. Well, yeah, when you get to the silly end of the weight spectrum, actually saving, uh, what is it, 30 grams for 30 bucks. Yeah. That's not bad, is it? A gram a dollar? You would spend a lot to do that on a pair of wheels, wouldn't you? Yeah, a lot really more would. than that, actually. Yeah. For sure you would. Yeah. I, to be fair, I came to the same conclusion at the Taipei show last year now actually, when I went to the Jaguar stand and they had some similarly lightweight cables on show. Now one team that might be in need of those special cables, John, are the Hagen's Berman Action Team. So they're a US registered continental team run by Axel Merckx, son of Eddie Merckx. And they're basically, well, they've been one of the key generators of young racing talent, haven't they, in recent mm -hmm. years. But this season, those guys are gonna be racing on aluminium frames, not carbon, which for the record, let me say, I think, is a great move, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic indeed. And to be precise, they're actually gonna be using the specialized LA Sprint models, and they're gonna be using them from the get-go. And amazingly, now the cost of that is three and a half thousand dollars less than the top of the range S-Works frame. As in the frame is three and a half thousand yeah, dollars yeah, less? the carbon frame costs three and a half thousand dollars more. Wow. And I'm sure that those riders will be showing that they don't need that top of the range bike because they're gonna be lighting up racing as ever. Yeah. Impressive I, team, aren't they? I think you're right there, actually. It's great to see, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, you know, we know you don't need absolute top of the range kit, but when those guys do graduate on to the next level of protein, there's then a step up, isn't there, in terms of the equipment that they can use. So it's, it's a great initiative. And it's just fantastic to see metal bikes in the peloton again. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, not to forget though, mate, they are going to be using uh, SRAM ETAP and also <laughs> zip carbon wheels. So they're not really slumming it, are they? No, no, not much actually. What's and actually the whole thing about cables, you know, they only need half of them anyway, don't they? Because yeah. they've got ETAP. Oh, I don't mind. Anyway, as nice as that bike is, it's no James Bond bike, is it? Rocket firing, ejector saddle, Oil dripping when you're being chased by a Bond villain. <laughs> no, not, not quite as cool as that, unfortunately. Uh, basically, uh, another team, a uh, British continental team this time, One Pro Cycling, have teamed up with Aston Martin, so the prestige car mark, uh, and they've got these as their team bikes. It's not an Aston Martin, although the badge on the downshoot would lead you to believe otherwise. It's actually a Stork Fast Scenario 3, and they've got a collaboration between the two brands there. Uh, but still, it's a nice looking bike. What do you think? That's nice, isn't it? They've also got team cars as well from Aston Martin. But I've been led to believe they're not going to be using those in the convoy because imagine driving a car of that value in the convoy. Quite frankly, it'd be terrifying, wouldn't it? Good point. So what they're going to do, a bit like the frame maybe, is actually just uh, wrap a normal car, maybe like a Ford Focus, and then, <laughs> and then put Aston Martin stickers all over it. No one will ever know. Yeah, genius. Right, last bit of tech. I spotted this stem on Cycling Insider and it's from NRG or Energy, get it? Uh, basically, it's a stem 
with a battery built inside. Oh, I get it. it. Yeah. Oh, he's got it. Anyway, it's a stem with a battery built inside, uh, so that presumably you can charge up your gears, mobile phone, lights, that kind of thing. Yeah, you could actually see a point in it hmm. for ultra endurance riders. So, for example, uh, last year when I was riding with Mark Beaumont, he set the round world record. He was doing 17-hour days on the bike. It's horrible, doesn't it? Even yeah. when you say it, Brutal. incredible. Um, anyway, so he was having to have um, to charge up bits and bobs like his Garmin head unit and stuff because it wasn't even lasting half a day, let alone an entire day. So we had a, a battery pack in a top tube bag. So this would be a really nice way of secreting it somewhere else. You do, of course, have to remember to charge it. Otherwise, <laughs> your DI2 will go flat, and then you'll find that your stem is also flat. Uh, but nevertheless, then you've run out of lights and yeah, yeah. You're, you're stuck. You, it's it's one more thing to charge, but it's also one extra safety net. Uh, unfortunately, we have no information on price, potential availability date, or even the capacity of the battery in the stem. But anyway, or the weight. Of, I'd like to know the weight of that as well. Yeah, good point. But that's actually. just because it's me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I'm quite. No, you mentioned it. I'm quite positive. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> Something for the pipeline. Watch this space. Yeah. And we'll have some more tech for you next week. It's Hall of Fame time now, and last week John and Emma inducted the Flight Titanium Saddle. This week we're going even more contemporary, aren't we? Because we've got Shimano Di2 electronic group set. Mm. Now, of course, for most of us, gears are still operated by mechanical uh, cables, so a Bowden cable, if you want to get technical, that connects the shifter to the derailleur. But with Di2, well, it kind of changed all that, didn't it? Yeah, um, we did see electronic group sets before, but let's face it, they weren't really... That... Effective? Yeah, effective, they didn't they work didn't very work. well. Yeah. yeah, you know, you'd go underneath some electricity cables and your gears would start shifting. But Shimano actually changed the whole game here by launching the DI2 group set. So, essentially, your levers are connected to a battery pack, which in turn then connects to your derailleurs via these electronic cables. So, press a button on the shifter, sends a signal to the derailleur and it moves. Sadly, we haven't got any batteries here linked up, but uh, I can tell you something, that the front derailleur is actually really where we noticed a big change, wasn't it? So you press that and the shifting would be so super reliable because the front derailleur was always a little bit hesitant on some cable systems back then. And the rear derailleur, super slick too. So it's yeah. super reliable. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Is that it changed shifting because it became even more effective than mechanical shifting. Now, it was first seen with Shimano logos on at the Tour of California in 2009, which used to be in February, remember? Mm. But weirdly, John actually spotted it <laughs> at the Tour of Germany in 2007. Now, I don't know why you were there, John, or indeed why you spotted it, but nevertheless, not gonna here tell are you your either. spy shots. Uh, and I tell you what, it was a pretty looking group set, wasn't it? Yeah. The one thing that struck me is that little LCD display on mm. the top of the shifters there. That never made it onto the road group sets, but it has on mountain bike DI2, which is kind of weird. Yeah. And also, the group set is, pro is proved so popular, it's trickled down to the Ultegra, uh, offering, which is obviously down from Durex, and you can even now integrate hydraulic sh brakes in, into there. Yeah, there we go. Uh, right, now do make sure that you keep suggesting your Hall of Fame nominees in the comment section down below. But before we leave, John, can you give me your best DI2 impression? Without sounding like, I don't know, a robot or something. Uh, <laughs> That's not bad, actually. Thanks. If you think you can do better, mm. send in your DI2 impressions. We could get like a montage of your impressions. Yeah. yeah. Now, hashtag for that could be GCN DI2. Impressions. Impressions, yeah. GCN DI2 impressions. Leave them on social media. If we get one, I'll be surprised. That's right. Video yourself. <laughs> yeah. And then you may... You may uh, Win a special prize. You probably regret it if you end up on the show. But anyway, there we go. <laughs> Next week, we're going to induct another product. It's Bike of the Week now. That point in the show where we give you two amazing, beautiful, fantastic bikes, but then we make you choose which one you prefer. Oof, it's always a tough one, isn't it, to yeah. choose? Anyway, last week, we put two time trial bikes head to head, and that was the Pinarello Bellide of Team Sky and the Canyon Speedmax of Team Katusha Alpacic. And the winner, with 69% of the votes, was the Canyon. 
Really? Yeah, I was wow. surprised at that because we've got a lot of Pinarello fans out there, isn't there? Yeah, there's like that kind of die-hard Pinarello fan, isn't there? But that canyon, that is lovely, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does look fast. I just hoped that the voters out there weren't swayed by Emma because, well, she tried her best. Did she? Yeah. Oh, that's just not cricket, is it? <laughs> uh, right then, this week you have a choice between another time trial bike. This one is a custom World Championship painted of course, it's Tom Dumoulin's Giant Trinity Advance. It's got Shimano Dura Ace 9150 Di2 groups on there. It's got Pro tri spoke and disc wheels. Of course, that lovely paint job. But it's not up against a TT bike. It's up against a road bike. We're making you choose between <laughs> apples and oranges because this is the aforementioned Greg Van Avermaet BMC Pro Olympic Edition bike, which is really, really rather nice. I'm not trying to sway anyone, John. But, you know. Well, you've got a matching jumper on. For his That's why I wore it, actually. I did ask for a gold logo, and they said, uh, you've never won anything in your life, so no chance, mate. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there we go. Yeah. So you know what to do. Vote up there for your favourite. And next week, we'll have two more head-to-head. -head. It's that time of the week. It's time for the bike vault. Oh. And I've got to say, there's been a few comments recently about the bike vault and how it should only be about the bike and nothing about the other stuff about it. So well, To be fair, mate, it makes a change from people complaining about your flipping buzzer air horn thing. Or my flip-flops. Yeah, exactly. So basically they're saying it should just be about the bike and nothing else. But, well, you've got to do it in a nice place as well, haven't you? So, I've just spoken to the owner of the bike vault, Mr. Martin Ashton. Let's hear what he's got to say. To start with, you need an image that's really strong, captivating, and shows how much love you've got for your bike. And secondly, if you're going to get in the bike vault, you need to add a little bit more. It needs to show the enjoyment and the atmosphere of the bike rides you go on. Right. Well, I hope that's cleared up a few things. Yeah, I think it's important, isn't it, that the bike vault shouldn't be the preserve of like super duper expensive bikes. Because nope. actually, you know, any bike can be a super nice bike. Exactly. So, uh, so that is why, if you're wondering. Yeah. Hey, by the way, where is your um, really annoying air horn this week? Yeah, I don't know, actually. But it's funny how you went to Stockholm and my uh, alarm hasn't been seen since. Anyway, we'll pick this up later. You guys thank me later. <laughs> right, okay, let's start then with no further ado. First up, Akmal J of Brunei. Check out that Canyon Aero. Super nice! Yeah. Sorry, I'm just Super a bit nice. early there, but that yeah, is cool, that. isn't it? Look at the backdrop. Yeah. And, and look, look at, at the bike. bike. That was like we rehearsed it, but yeah. we hadn't. We did it. What's he got on there? I'm not uh, very good at I'll identifying. Altegra, yeah. he's, got, Glad you uh, that he's one. got oversized pulley wheel system as well. Oh yeah, check uh, it out. Cosmics. <laughs> weird. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Uh, what's that? Vittoria Corsa gun wall tyres. I mean... Nice. Is that a Movistar colourway as well? It is, yeah. Looks and a bit like it. Uh, and a Movistar bottle as well. The important things like your cranks, horizontal, sticking the big chain ring and the 11 at the back. Yeah, that um, is cool. And an awesome backdrop. What and also, like me actually, running a little bit of stack under your bars. It's the best thing about that, is that you've got aero spacers, so I think yeah. it looks cool. So there we go, that <laughs> is... Well, super nice. Mate. Super nice. Super nice. Right, Embraer of Norway, De Rosa 838. I love a De Rosa. I know, I do too, actually. That is a cool looking bike. Nice I like, bike, I like a bit of sea in the background, that's yeah. cool. No horse riding sign, that also makes me, uh, makes me happy. Uh, cranks at the wrong position, John. Yeah. Yeah. What cranks are they? I can't see from this they distance. Are, that looks like an old Tegra group set too. Ah, can't okay. really quite see. And the problem with this is it's quite poorly lit, isn't it? And we yeah. talk about the composition and stuff. So for me, it only gets a nice and oh, he's got He's gone for like almost a kind of like sunset kind of shot. But yeah, yeah. without the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it pains me, mate, because that is a flipping lovely bike. But no, all right, yeah. it's only a nice. Yeah. It's a nice Sorry. bike. It's still a nice one. Oh, I, I like to throw a curveball in. Woo! And look at this. Fabian. Smoking. Malaysia. What's that? Pinarello Treviso. That is cool, isn't it? I, you know, when someone gets the mix of old and new right, it really pops. So you've got a kind of a, a nice steel traditional frame there with a quill stem, and you've got some deep section carbon <laughs> wheels. And what is that chain ring? That is rude. I don't know. It looks big, though, doesn't it? That looks like a. Mind you, it's quite a small bike. But it does like a big old chain ring. Oh, don't know. But that yeah. is super nice, if you ask me. That is cool. And yeah, I'd, what I really like about the photo, John, is we've got the bike in focus and the background out of focus. Yeah. So it really brings it out. Plus, we've got horizontal cranks. And we've also got a very nice stick 
that it's lent on there. Oh, so, there uh, it is. I missed the stick. Super nice. There you go. Yeah, super nice. Oh, man, I'm pretty jealous about that. That is wicked. Right. Wow, there's a photo and a half, isn't it? <laughs> Nikita came of Moscow in Russia and this Java track bike. Someone has risked it for a biscuit for that, John. Because that looks like... Is that actually a car lane? I can see a car in the background. I hope not. Anyway, Nikita. I love the shot. Once again, we've got a cracking composition. Bike in focus. Our shot. I love the, the road yeah. tapering to a point. That is cool. That is. And look, it looks to be propped up with a beer can. Or a drinks can anyway. I'm not sure what's underneath that. Extra points for that. Yeah. That's got to be super nice. Finally, uh, Noah from Cornwall in England and this Isla Bikes Lueth 26. Love it. That is cool, isn't it? I'm partial to an Isla Bike, personally. Yeah. Hang on a minute, John. Is that our saver what I think it is? It is. It's a GCN ass saver. Oh, you know how to make us smile. Noah. Noah. Yeah, very You know what cool. you've got? Super nice bike. Ah, oh, there we go. Concluding on a super nice. Yeah. So as ever, remember to send in your pictures of your bikes to go into the bike vault, the email address on screen. Yeah, and now you know that the composition is also key, as well as having a porno bike. Right, that's it, Si. We're nearly at the end of the show. Ah, oh, John. I know, but don't worry, because tomorrow, I'm going to find out exactly what he was up to in Stockholm. No, oh, there's a new tech video. Oh, yeah. First look at some amazing new tech. Wow. And then on Saturday, we're in the tech clinic fixing your problems. Sunday, check out Elia Viviani's Pro Bike. Ooh, specialised Vengevice disc, John. Yeah, that's a beauty. And that's a mouthful of a bike as well, too, isn't it? He's going I well, don't think I try to eat it, if I'm honest. It's not my cup of tea. Come on, mate. Then Monday, uh, back in the workshop, actually, to tell you about some essential tools you need to fix your bike at home. All right, before leaving this video, please do make sure you head over to the GCN shop. Not only have we got our threads that we are doing our best to, you know, sport very uh, charmingly, uh, but also we've got GCN ass saves as well. So if you, if you fancy a leg up in the bike vault, <laughs> head over there. No, we're really not biased, are yeah. uh, But anyway, please go over there and show your support for the channel. And then, of course, before leaving this video, why not click on another one? What about one of Lloydie's tech mm. extravaganzas from the Abu Dhabi tour? 